name is Andrzej Novak. I work at CERN and in particular at CERN Open Lab. I will explain to you what this is during the slideshow. I will talk to you about um, the way CERN generates and processes its data, and you know, you might call it big data, you might call it something else. There's you know one key difference with many of the uh, with many of the business presentation we've seen, and that is that we're cheating a little bit because we actually control the source of our data. So we are generating it, and then we have the task of processing it, and and that's something that's um, that's a big advantage. So CERN is the European Particle Physics Laboratory. It's the mecca of the particle physics community. This is where physicists from 110 countries come together to work on, on common problems in physics and in hydrogen physics. It was founded, founded in 1954 by 12 countries, and then it has expanded to 20 members that it has currently, and it's also transitioning to become a worldwide particle physics laboratory. And um, we have about 2,500 personnel, but more than 15,000 users. So on site, on each, at each time, there's about 10,000 people. So in the end, CERN is like a small city. We have our own roads, we have our own post office, we have um, a bank, and so on. And the budget is about a billion Swiss francs per year. And I really like to argue that this is not a lot, that this is a small budget, because um, this is probably the equivalent of one cup of coffee per European per year. So it's really you know, not that much to contribute to cutting edge world-class science. And another analogy they have or, or comparison is that the spending in the United States on potato chips every year is seven billion dollars. And we spend only one billion dollars on cutting edge science. So I think it's a very good deal and it's a good value for money proposition. So, what, what do we really do at CERN? I mean, you, you know, we have lots of particle accelerators. I will, I will talk about them in a minute. But the kind of main problem that drives us is that we don't know what 95% of the universe is made of. So we know that 95% of the universe is stipulated to be dark matter and dark energy. But we haven't really observed it. We haven't had the opportunity to understand what it is. So with time, we're going to work, uh, work through that. We want to explain why particles have mass. So that's another big question at the Higgs boson that's probably had been observed. Is something that we think is responsible for mass. And, and it would complete the standard model of physics. So you know, to the standard model that we use today, uh, we would have to add this Higgs boson. And then we have to add to you know, every physics book that has been published. If we consider physics books, um, we would like to uh, we would like to be able to contribute and to um, to to you know deepen our understanding. And of course, this fundamental science later translates onto technological progress. This is not something that uh, you know just stays within the scientific field. All this science later gets translated onto um, technology and the improvement of, of uh, lives of all the people around us. So other other mysteries that we have are you know what happened immediately after the Big Bang. Um, is nature symmetrical? Is there you know, matter and antimatter in equal uh, quantities in the universe? And for example, we are made of matter, but we knew that at the beginning of the universe, there was an equal amount of matter and antimatter. And, and we don't know uh, why there's this small amount that we're made of left, uh, left over. So all in all, it's a very beautiful mystery that we have a privilege to, to investigate. On this slide, you can see the Large Hadron Collider. It's essentially like a super microscope that really allows us to go down deep into the structure of matter and see microscopic particles and infer what's happening on, on a really small scale. So in the background, you see lots of European landmarks. There's the Mont Blanc, there's Lake Geneva, which is one of the deepest lakes in, uh, in Europe. And you also have the city of Geneva, which has a population of about 200,000. The whole agglomeration is about a million. And a big part of that is, is formed out of uh, employees of international organizations like, uh, like CERN. So the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is our main particle accelerator. That's the machine that we use for discovery. And possibly this is the largest machine ever built by man. So, so it's a very, very significant technological undertaking. And we basically built it as a prototype of itself. We don't have an opportunity to test a machine like that. It has to work the first time we connect it. So basically, um, thousands of scientists and engineers from various laboratories uh, across the world um, have taken part in this construction, and it had to work from the first time. And it did work in the, from the first time, as you might have seen in, in the news announcements in, in the previous years. This 27-kilometer ring is actually placed 100 meters underground in a tunnel that was bored for, uh, for a previous accelerator. It was removed since, and then we put in the machine that we're using today. The length of the whole ring is 27 kilometers. That, so you know, the large in Large Hadron Collider is probably an understatement because it really is an enormous tunnel. Of course, the Swiss are experts at building tunnels, so currently they are constructing even longer ones. 
but uh, but we think it's it's a pretty significant achievement, especially um, you know in a, in a time when, uh, when when things are difficult for many people. So inside the accelerator, we have four interaction points of proton beams. So actually, um, there are two um, two proton beams that circulate inside in opposite directions, and there are four interaction point, points uh, where we collide those beams. And, and in those interaction points, we have placed enormous detectors that monitor the collisions. So we have about 40 million collisions per second. This is the rate at which we try to collide those beams. And the, whole, uh, the power consumption of the whole um, accelerator complex is about 150 to 200 megawatts. So this is um, equivalent to the power consumption of, of a whole city, of, of, well, of, of a medium-sized city. So to give you an idea of how we work with data and how we gather this, this you know, big data or, or so-called big data, we have prepared an animation in collaboration with TED to show you how you know, the data collection that we have relates to the general uh, big data problems at large. So let's see the animation. Big data is an elusive concept. It represents an amount of digital information which is uncomfortable to store, transport, or analyze. Big data is so voluminous that it overwhelms the technologies of the day and challenges us to create the next generation of data storage tools and techniques. So big data isn't new. In fact, physicists at CERN have been wrangling with the challenge of their ever-expanding big data for decades. Fifty years ago, CERN's data could be stored in a single computer. OK, so it wasn't your usual computer, this was a mainframe computer that filled an entire building. To analyse the data, physicists from around the world travelled to CERN to connect to the enormous machine. In the 1970s, our ever-growing big data was distributed across different sets of computers which mushroomed at CERN. Each set was joined together in dedicated home grid networks. But physicists collaborated without regard for the boundaries between sets, hence needed to access data on all of these. So we bridged the independent networks together in our own CERN net. In the 1980s, islands of similar networks speaking different dialects sprung up all over Europe and the States making remote access possible but tortuous. To make it easy for our physicists across the world to access the ever-expanding big data stored at CERN without travelling, the networks needed to be talking with the same language. We adopted the fledgling inter-networking standard from the States, followed by the rest of Europe, and we established the principal link at CERN between Europe and the States in 1989, and the truly global internet took off. Physicists could easily then access the terabytes of big data remotely from around the world, generate results and write papers in their home institutes. Then they wanted to share the findings with all their colleagues. To make this information sharing easy, we created the web in the early 1990s. Physicists no longer needed to know where the information was stored in order to find it and access it on the web, an idea which caught on across the world and has transformed the way we communicate in our daily lives. During the early 2000s, the continued growth of our big data outstripped our capability to analyse it at CERN, despite having buildings full of computers. We had to start distributing the petabytes of data to our collaborating partners in order to employ local computing and storage at hundreds of different institutes. In order to orchestrate these interconnected resources with their diverse technologies, we developed a computing grid enabling the seamless sharing of computing resources around the globe. This relies on trust relationships and mutual exchange. But this grid model could not be transferred out of our communities so easily, where not everyone has resources to share, nor could companies be expected to have the same level of trust. Instead, an alternative, more business-like approach for accessing on-demand resources has been flourishing recently, called cloud computing, which other communities are now exploiting to analyse their big data. It might seem paradoxical for a place like CERN 
a lab focused on the study of the unimaginably small building blocks of matter to be the source of something as big as big data. But the way we study the fundamental particles, as well as the forces by which they interact, involves creating them fleetingly colliding protons in our accelerators and capturing a trace of them as they zoom off near light speed. To see those traces, our detector, with 150 million sensors, acts like a really massive 3D camera, taking a picture of each collision event at up to 40 million times per second. That makes a lot of data. But if big data has been around for so long, why do we suddenly keep hearing about it now? Well, as the old metaphor explains, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and it is no longer just science that is exploiting this. The fact that we can derive more knowledge by joining related information together and spotting correlations can inform and enrich numerous aspects of everyday life, either in real time, such as traffic or financial conditions, in short-term evolutions, such as medical or meteorological, or in predictive situations such as business, crime or disease trends. Virtually every field is turning to gathering big data, with mobile sensor networks spanning the globe, cameras on the ground and in the air, archives storing information published on the web, and loggers capturing the activities of Internet citizens the world over. The challenge is on to invent new tools and techniques to mine these vast stores, to inform decision-making, to improve medical diagnosis, and otherwise to answer needs and desires of tomorrow's society in ways that are unimagined today. So this gave us an idea of, of, um, of the challenges we have to deal with and you know, you know, also the context with which we work. As you've already seen, you know, we have this superconducting ring, which is the accelerator in which protons circulate. In order to be able to generate really strong magnetic fields that would allow us to control particles circulating in this accelerator, we need to use um, superconductivity um, to power the magnets, to, to basically um, create electromagnets. So um, for superconductivity, you really need uh, very low temperatures. And we used to say that CERN is the coolest place in the universe because we actually generate temperatures um, in those magnets that are colder than outer space. So the temperature of the magnets can be 1.8 to 1.9 Kelvin, very, very low. Um, at the same time, in the collision points, we generate also the hottest temperatures in the universe because um, some of these can be 100,000 times hotter uh, than the center of the sun. So um, these collisions, uh, you know, combined with, uh, with the um, temperature at which the magnets operate, generate a very, very big spectrum, which is hard to manage technologically. So we have detectors placed in four points around the accelerator. And these are really enormous devices. They are composed of various trackers and pixel detectors and so on. The size of one of these things is, is comparable to the size of a cathedral. And we should still keep in mind that they are all buried 100 meters underground. So you know, const constructing this is, is, is not really easy. So there are huge collaborations behind these, these things. You have probably uh, you know, between two and 5,000 people working on a single detector like that. And, and you know, combining all the um, all the data that's coming out of it is also a very very significant challenge. So, what happens inside is that particles collide with each other, and then they generate kind of a soup of, of secondary particles that just spill off uh, in all directions. And then the detector has to um, take a picture of the aftermath of the collision. So, it has to take a picture of all these uh, you know showers of particles that were created and then has to uh, you know, somehow tell us what were the original particles that collided, and you know, out of those that spilled around, um, what were their tra trajectories, energies, and so on. So um, you could compare this to a, uh, to a digital camera that's um, taking a picture 40 million times per second, and it has 150 megapixels, between 100 and 150 megapixels. And on top of that, this camera is constantly blurry, so you have to readjust the lens all the time to make sure that you're capturing the right thing. So it's a pretty, pretty big challenge, and when you combine all this data together, you, you not only need the data that comes from the collision itself, but also you need to take into account the 3D um, position of the detector in, in space. And you know, when, when, for example, there is an earthquake in China, we can detect it and we can feel it, and we have to adjust our instruments to compensate for the movement of the Earth. Because you know, we are trying to look at 
really, really small particles. Um, so we get as raw data really very, very basic uh, measurements. For example, was a detector element hit? Uh, how much energy was there in a particle at which time and so on. But then we reconstruct this information to form particle tracks to assign types to particles. And we can never say for sure that a certain particle that was flying through was, was you know, a proton or electron or something else. We, uh, we typically create a matrix of probabilities and then we say the highest probability is that this particle was that kind. And that means that another particle that we have seen a moment later must have come from it or something like that. So, so there's a very long chain of, um, of, of inference there. But the thing is, you know, we run these collisions 40 million times per second, but in the end, it is only one collision in 10 trillion that is really interesting. So we have to manage somehow this, this complexity and for the sake of, uh, of, of storage, if not anything else, we have to find a way to filter out in real time only the data that is really interesting to us. And obviously we cannot have the computational complexity today to filter out one event in 10 trillion, but we certainly can reduce the volumes by 10,000 or by, by 100,000 relatively easily. So that relates to the question of data processing. A lot of this is being done in hardware because when we designed this 15 or 20 years ago, we didn't really have a view of how software could do these things and only now we are slowly moving um, to software with, with, uh, with some of these processing stages. You have readout from the hardware, which basically is just the raw data, which is the 150 million channels combined together telling you something. You know, where there was a signal or there was not a signal. And, and maybe it will tell you what intensity or, or what time it was at. When we move on, we have some front-end electronics and, and load balancers that allow us to transfer this data further and reduce it. So, for example, the channels that don't give us any kind of information are just muted out. So we only combine those that are interesting. So that already gives you... Um, a reduction factor of about 10x. But then after that, there is a really complex engine that um, filters out, um, that filters out the, um, um, the events that are representing physics that is already known. So if we see collisions that represent something that we have already observed before, we try not to keep it. So we only keep it when there are multiple systems telling us, yes, this is a, this is a data point that is, that is worth keeping. And that enables us to maintain um, you know, some reasonable data volume. It's still very large. So this kind of decision must be taken um, within one microsecond or within two microseconds of the data arriving. If, if we don't manage to do that, um, then we have to throw the data point away and we have to accept the next buffer. So in order to be able to process the data efficiently, we have a very limited amount of time to, to process the data. So you must pass a data point through multiple layers in order for it to be rejected. So we don't reject physics easily. That, that might be interesting. You really need a confirmation that this is something that is very well understood. And then the data is shipped out for, for offline processing, and this is described on this slide. We have online triggering and, and filtering in detectors, which is what, what was on the previous slide. And then on the other hand, we have event simulation. So we try to simulate in complex Monte Carlo models what we expect in practice from physics, right? And then once we have this simulation, we have the output of the simulation, which is what we expect. And on the other hand, we have the experimental output. We can compare the two, the two with each other and we can say, okay, we see a difference between what we expect and, and what we've observed, or we don't see any difference. And if we see a difference, what is the statistical significance of that difference? And in practice, that means that we must understand the data very, very well. So we must know exactly what's happening. And we also must work in a, in a statistical way. So we generate more and more data in order to be able to confirm with higher probability uh, or higher certainty our, our, our assumptions. And further on, this simulation and the practical output from the experiment are combined together. And then there are further stages of data reduction. So um, here we have something that is raw data, but it already is reduced from the online part. So the part, that, the part of the detector that accepts the data already throws away a lot of it that is not really immediately interesting. This data is later reprocessed. And then event summary data is generated out of it. So this is very much similar. This is very similar to um, generating a higher level overview of, of what the data represents or what is, what is inside. And then comes the part of analysis, which is actually what the physicist normally would do. So a physicist is sitting at his or her desk and, and they are trying to run an analysis on the data that they got. And usually they work on objects 
that are smaller or much smaller than what you, that, than what you would get as a, as a standard data file. So one event size is, is, is probably only one megabyte today. So, so it's, it's really not a lot, but we need to capture lots of those events in order to be able to find those that are really interesting. And then we need to make sure that we don't throw away anything that's, that's uh, really useful. Out of those inputs, we combine something that we might call big data, and it's not only big because the volume is large, but it's also big because it's pretty complicated to analyze it, and the output that we're going to get out of it is also going to have big impact in terms of science. After all, understanding deeply the standard model of physics is, is something that mankind should, should definitely aspire to. So locally at CERN today, we have already surpassed 100 petabytes of data stored. So we have tape systems, but we also have disk systems that mirror the tape capacity. And these are st stored in, in hundreds of millions of files. So we have special storage systems that allow us to pull out a file, whether it's on disk, in cache, or whether it's on tape, and, and then further analyze it. And data preservation is a very important aspect because you might want to come back to this data 10 or 15 years later and, and say, you know, a new phenomenon was discovered, let's take the data we collected before to see if we can observe it or if we can confirm it, or if this data set um, is available to us so that we can enhance our understanding. And when we were running the previous accelerator, the LEP, um, the peak of scientific output came after the accelerator was shut down. So it is only then when we had the maximum number of papers published and, and produced when, when the accelerator was shut down because it takes a really long time to analyze this data and, and it's not a problem of computing, it's a problem of human understanding and, and, and producing the right theories and explanations for what we see. So processing all of this is not really feasible on a single site and certainly was unimaginable to build data centers 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. It was not really thought that we could build data centers that could cope with this um, locally. So we built the Large Hadron Collider computing grid. And it's a worldwide structure of data centers into which the physicist sitting at, at his or her desk can just insert the workload. And this federation of data centers then automatically assigns the workload somewhere and this workload is then executed and the results are delivered to, back, to, back to the origin. So if today you are in Geneva and you are sending your job, you're, you're sending your code and your data to be processed, you know, it, could, it could be processed anywhere in the world and you don't even know, you know what kind of computer is going to process it. You just have a standard level of service. So this is very much like uh, you know, the cloud computing model you have today, but the only difference is that we designed this when we had no idea cloud computing would, uh, would, would ever appear. So the grid is used um, quite often by, by many other sciences. Uh, Hydrogen physics is not the only one. We have astrophysics, earth sciences, um, uh, life sciences, fusion research, and so on. So there are, you know, there are multiple incentives for scientists to work in this model because when you pull together the resources, uh, you can do much more with less. This is um, a kind of an onion structure. In the center, we have the Tier zero data center at CERN, which is accepting all the data that's coming in from the detectors. That stream is about 10 gigabytes per second of data that needs to be stored somewhere. I mean, most of that we want to store permanently. So we're going to throw away some of it after reprocessing and realizing that there's nothing interesting in it. But some of it is going to be, uh, to be stored forever. So that mostly happens in tier zero, but the tier one or the middle uh, yellow layers that you see on the slide also have admission of, of storing the data. So there's a copy of the data distributed across those sites. And then there's probably 130 tier two sites which uh, are much closer to the physicists that actually do the science and they are local data centers. So on those data centers you typically would put analysis jobs. Um, so something that's much, much closer to the kind of big data processing that is uh, often seen in, in business and, and in commerce. So we process more than two million jobs per day. And the amount of data stored on the grid is probably 250 petabytes. And to process it, we use uh, in the order of 350,000 Intel architecture cores. So those are you know, both Intel and AMD machines. Uh, but they're all uh, clustered around this uh, Linux uh, x86 uh, uh, ecosystem. Why do we do all of this? This is the answer. This is the cover of Physics Letters B that talks about the first hints of the Higgs boson or, or what we might think is the Higgs boson. You know, immediately multiple media across the whole world caught up on this piece of news because this is something that really fundamentally explains the way matter is organized. This is the one final missing link in the standard model of physics. 
And we have had the opportunity of sharing this experience with the world. So more than 1,000 TV stations transmitted images from the announcement of the discovery of a new particle. It reached about an estimated 1 billion people, so it's a pretty, pretty wide reach. And Peter Higgs, who is one of the theorists who are behind this idea of this Higgs boson, said that it's a really incredible thing that this a discovery happened in his lifetime. And I think we are lucky to be able to say the same because uh, we have had the chance to witness uh, something, you know, an event in physics that really completes our understanding of, uh, of many of the items in matter. So all of this work is to produce a single plot, much like this one, which gives you the probability that what we see at a certain energy is just noise or is, is not meaningful. And this spike uh, tells us that there is a microscopic probability that what we are seeing there is just noise or this is just, just a statistical fluke. So if we reach a level of confidence that we describe as five sigma, then we can say that we have a scientific discovery and it is universally agreed that this is something that we should be sharing with others and, and we, should be, uh, we should be understanding. So in comes the big data and out comes big science. And you know this plot is not very big, but the implications that this plot has uh, are very big. Then we also have one slide that was shown uh, during the announcement and, and this comes from one of the experiments and there are two interesting things to note about it. One thing is that when you have a serious physics discovery you must always use the Comic Sans font. So for the most serious discoveries you use the least serious font. I don't know why that is but I think it's, it's, it's a rule of thumb. And the other interesting thing is that this demonstrates the importance of computing in our discovery process because without the performance of the grid and without the performance of our data analysis systems, we would never have been able to, to make these discoveries. And most importantly, we would not have been able to, um, to produce them so quickly. So this is something exceptional. Um, the grid and the way data is analyzed um, allows for a very fast discovery or a very fast, um, very fast processing. And this, is, this high throughput system is something interesting. Another interesting fact to note is that when physicists publish work that is related to a certain experiment, they typically try to put all the names of the people currently involved in the experiment. So you would see in a, in a physics paper, you would see several pages of, of science and then probably 10 or 15 pages of names of people who participate in this. So it's a global effort that really is, is, is something that is taken, taken very seriously. So all of this is related to the innovation in computing that CERN is, uh, CERN is also responsible for. Uh, this caliber of discovery is not possible without uh, strong innovation in computing, with, without innovation in networking, and also without uh, very intense networking between people. So we have seen in the animation that um, human interaction is one of the things that really, that really feeds our process of discovery. But there's also a lot of the technology that's behind it. So, for example, in 1989, um, CERN has uh, developed the first transatlantic links uh, between Europe and the US. Um, we were not the ones who developed the technology, but we were the ones who, who employed it for the first time. In 1991, uh, the World Wide Web was invented at CERN. And this is probably the point where I should mention that usually we meet two types of people. We meet uh, people who think that the internet was invented at CERN, which is not true because the internet was invented in the US in the 70s and came out of the DARPA program. And there are people who think that the web was invented in the US, which is also not true because the web was invented at CERN. So, you know, it again shows that international collaboration can really bring us, uh, bring us very good things. So then moving on, we have developed um, uh, what we call the shift architecture, that's the scalable, heterogeneous um, interconnected facility. And we got the Computer World 21st Century Achievement Award for that architecture because it enabled us to seamlessly scale uh, compute storage and tape units uh, throughout, our, throughout our processing scheme. So we were actually able to keep adding resources in a very efficient way um, that has not really been employed uh, in the past. Um, after that, we've managed to um, beat several Internet 2 land speed records. So we were working on advanced uh, networking because that's what was uh, very important to us at the time. Today, uh, the digital world has, uh, you know, um, really moved forward. So we have the opportunity to benefit from uh, standard off-the-shelf technology. But in, the, in those times, it was not that easy. Um, then the WLCG became the world's light, largest grid. And in 2012, the LHC is in delivering on intense data processing challenges. So we get a lot of data in in a very short time, 
and, and we, have to, we have to process it and give the answer very quickly. So one thing, you know, one challenge that we have to deal with today is the challenge of the past and the fact that a lot of our code or a lot of the understanding that we have in physics is based around what was developed in the past. So, you know, in the past you used to write, for example, Fortran code and Fortran stands for formula translation. And then if you see that you have, for example, half a million of lines of a code like that, it's, it's not really well manageable. And then if you translate it to another language like C++, then it becomes even more complicated. So managing this complexity is a very, very important part of the problem. And it's also about managing the process. It's not just managing you know, the infrastructure. It's also about managing the process. So another issue that we have um, that comes from the past is the fact that computers are still as uh, smart or as dumb as they were 50 years ago in the sense that, for example, um, the amount of time that it takes to multiply two floating point numbers is five cycles still today. So on the Ferranti Mercury computer that you see here on the screen from the 60s, it was five cycles as well. So we haven't really advanced on many of the fronts of computing where we might expect improvements because probably the guys who developed this just got it right for the first time and there's not much more we can do, which is very impressive on one, one hand but gives us headaches today. Another challenge is the challenge of the now, I would say. So basically what we have to deal with in terms of the data volumes and, and data challenges that we have today. Um, one big part of that is storage. So you have already seen that we have uh, approximately 100 petabytes of data. Um, and we store it both on tape and on disk. So obviously all the tape has to be backed up on, all, all the data has to be backed up on tape. But a lot of it is cached on disk for, for immediate retrieval. So if, it, if a scientist queries a data point, that file might be retrieved immediately. Um, so for tape management, we use a home-built system called Castor. And for disk management, you use a, use a system called EOS. Um, so we try to adopt some ideas from, from, from more modern architectures and technologies like Hadoop and so on. But the truth is that a lot of the processing that we have is, is really directly um, related to our home-built systems that were designed when the you know, digital explosion, let's call it, has not taken, had not taken place yet. Um, another area of interest is worldwide computing. So today we are, we are scaling out very, very well with, uh, with the number of, uh, number of systems that we keep adding. So we just keep adding more cores and we keep getting more performance. But there are lots of interesting technologies on the table that we also should be looking at. And probably this is the challenge of the future. And at the end, we have the challenge of data analysis. So for data analysis, we have our own statistics toolkit called Root. And again, this is a, this is a program or, or, or toolkit that was created um, just because at the time, there was nothing that could satisfy our requirements. And today, it's maintained in parallel uh, to many other popular solutions. And still, um, it is very good at dealing with large data volumes from accelerators um, that, that physicists have to process today. So we can't really plug in um, a, any open source or easily available solution and replace our systems with it. So then we have uh, the challenge of the future, which is dealing with big or, or bigger data. You know, all that I described until now, you know, this 40 million times per second collisions combined with 100 million pixels in each collision uh, this is cakewalk compared to what we will have to deal with in the future because we expect that the data rates at the LHC could increase by as much as 100 times. So this is a very significant increase because already today it's a challenge for us to manage what we, we can uh, produce. So there are multiple planned upgrades, uh, especially in the online part that is taking the data directly. And for us, sustainability is inseparably linked to scalability. So if we can scale, and we can maintain that scaling, that means that we are sustainable. In the future, we might expect data rates that could reach an exabyte per second. You know, the, the, the complete raw data that would be then processed by electronics could reach that kind of, uh, that kind of scale. We would have to store exabytes yearly, and already uh, there are other sciences, like for example genomics, that already talk about uh, this, this kind of data rate. And we would definitely need millions of computing cores. So today we know that um, our computing efficiency has to rise by at least 10 times so that we can cope with the mountain of data that we're going to produce in the near future. So those are all very, very significant challenges of the, of the near future. So that's one of the reasons why we founded something called the CERN Open Lab. It's a collaboration of CERN and industrial partners. 
where we have the opportunity to evaluate cutting edge solutions for the Large Hadron Collider community. So partners typically support manpower and equipment in dedicated competence centers. So I work most closely with Intel uh, since I am, uh, I am linked to computing efficiency. But there are also other data, that other competence centers that focus on networking, that focus on data analysis and storage. We also have Siemens who works closely with the accelerated control guys. So all of this um, is really an experiment on a very large scale. We are privileged to be able to take that advanced infrastructure and, and be able to run experiments on it. So we also have something which we call the Helix Nebula. It's a cloud computing partnership that is founded by over 30 partners um, today. And the aim is that by uh, 2020, there is an open science cloud created for European scientists to efficiently use. Um, so, so there's a lot of work going around the, the infrastructure. And you can see that the partners here are pretty big names in science, so CERN is one, but you also have the EMBL laboratory, which is focusing on life sciences, and we also have the European Space Agency, which is focusing on space exploration. To that, you can add lots of major technology partners. You have um, Capgemini, Telefonica, there's, uh, there's Cloud Sigma, SAP, T-Systems, many companies that want to collaborate on creating these new systems for, uh, for efficient data, data processing anywhere in the world. Moving beyond particle physics, you know, there are many challenges that can be solved using the technology that we use, but we also have to solve uh, many additional challenges. So particle physics is one, but we also talked a lot in this forum at least about societal challenges, biomedical applications. So next generation genome sequencing is one of those things. It's a, it's a pretty big challenge. We have also other sciences, for example, in the Helix Nebula project, the European Space Agency is planning to analyze the movements of the Earth's crust so that they can predict better earthquakes and various volcanic eruptions. So this is um, really the point where you see that big data being processed by big compute that serves big science, that really delivers value to society um, through advanced computing. So we try to share the knowledge and the experience that we have, and for that reason we have created multiple uh, educational programs. We're not trying to sleep on our data, on the contrary, we're trying to share it with others. And you know, we have a whole range of uh, various training initiatives that are, that are based at CERN, but that, that spread much further. Um, we have the academic training program for teachers, for example. We have the technical training program for employees and engineers of, uh, of, of CERN and related institutes. Um, we have various outreach programs, workshops. Uh, we also participate very actively in the framework program seven. We also participated in FP6 and Horizon 2020 is something we're preparing actively for because we think that uh, we have the responsibility to share the findings that we have and not only those that relate to our core business, so to speak, which is, which is high energy physics, but also those that relate to uh, any other domain we touch on and where we have the opportunity to innovate. So to give you just two examples of the innovation in, in science and technology that we're related to, one thing that we do is hadron therapy, for example. So there have been uh, tens of thousands of patients treated worldwide, and this kind of therapy allows to direct beams of particles in a very precise way for really localized treatment in, in, in patients with uh, various kinds of localized difficulties. Um, we also participate in the PET imaging program, so we develop a lot of the core technology that's behind the PET scanner that's, uh, that's gaining popularity. And there's a clinical trial that's, that's I think, already finished in, in Portugal that really allows us to generate much better imagery. So the technology and the science that's done at CERN is not only um, related to you know, primary um, fundamental science, but it also has the opportunity to produce numerous technology spin-offs. One of them is the World Wide Web that we all use today, but there are also many other domains in life, you know, especially in medicine, where we are very happy to contribute and to help. So to summarize this, we think that big data is really important in terms of storage and management, in terms of networking and communication, not just between computers, but also between people. Computation is something very important because that's what really drives us and that's what enables us to do the work. And the IT environment should not be underestimated either. So um, generating a favorable IT environment that's really adapted to large scale structures is something that enables us to, um, to, to thrive and to grow. And that's also something that enables us to move towards sustainable computing. So um, 
All this is made successful and it's made possible thanks to the dedication of thousands of my colleagues. I'm only here today explaining these things to you because of, uh, because of their work. And it's a global effort that produces a global success. So, um, you know, we've moved from really good performance of accelerators and the devices that we've used to collect the data um, to ex extremely good performance of various uh, computing infrastructures that drive the discovery process. And, you know, that enables us then to observe a new particle that enables us to contribute to European science in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, innovation and technology. And you know, this historic milestone uh, is, is just the beginning of the very long journey that is, that is ahead of us. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak here before, in front of you. And I hope that you've learned something interesting about how our big data um, drives big science. Thank you very much.